Welcome back, everybody. Um, this morning, John Murphy talked a little bit about today being the time of your life where there would be the least amount of change. As you've noticed, we've had a lot of changes in our conference over the last couple years, and I would like to think that our marketing department is probably hoping that this type of change doesn't continue. So good thing getting us back online, and we're glad to be here. So Tom has had several opportunities to introduce himself already. We'd like to um, introduce um, John McBride and go ahead and take a minute to share a little bit about your role at Pros. And sure. Do. So I am the head of Global Travel Product Management. So my team is responsible for de uh, defining the vision, the product strategy roadmap, and then executing. We're kind of a unique organization at Pros where product management actually owns the P&L of all of our products. It's not finance, it's not sales, it's actually product management. And so we sort of look at it, a product manager is like a CEO of each of their product lines and to where they have a team that's supporting them from sales or uh, marketing, et cetera. I've been at Pros for about 13 years. Prior to Pros, I was a, a researcher and lecturer at a university and I was actually hired by the first employee of Pros and I guess about two years ago, I ended up taking over the entire travel business unit. Okay. So, and I, okay. I really appreciate you having me back. I, I have a joke with others that I try not to get invited back every year, but it's not working. So, <laughs> I try to say, <laughs> anyway. Well, but I really do appreciate you having me back, and it's, a, it's, it's really great. I mean, seeing the evolution of Elevate over the years, because I started coming, I think, back in maybe 2013 or 15, I can't remember, and, you know, participating in innovation forums. and. Just seeing the evolution of Elevate has been really impressive. I mean, you really are setting the bar high for me. Now I got to go back to Houston and tell everybody, well, HPCO did this, now we need that. So thank you, thanks again. Yes, well, we're very glad to have you back. And Marshall Lapp from American, um, head of OR, so would you like to? Sure, uh, hello everybody, my name is Marshall Lapp. I work at American Airlines in Revenue Management. I'm responsible for the Operations Research and Data Science Group. Um, essentially, that is a fancy way of saying we are responsible for all the systems that power revenue management, um, everything from yield management to pricing systems to ancillary science, um, as well as all of our data infrastructure to make sure that we make the right decisions. Uh, this is a step that we took at American fairly recently where um, instead of just having sort of uh, a yield management systems group we did some pricing. We didn't really think about ancillary for a while um, in terms of building math models behind it. Uh, we said, as we think about this new world, about whether it's retailing or whatever the right term is, um, as we think about sort of this idea of total aircraft optimization, we have to make sure that we build our systems that are able to talk to each other. Um, and one of the things to be able to do that is you need to have a team that is responsible for bringing sort of yield management, pricing, ancillary, um, all of this, in my mind, into the same group so we can talk about making the right decision for all of our flights that are not siloed in terms of pricing yield or, um, you know, for example, whether I charge somebody for a seat or not. So, um, so my team is essentially responsible for that. Um, I, um, unlike John, um, I am one of the 200, I think that, uh, um, I think Rolf talked about this morning, uh, the first timers, so to speak, here at Elevate. Um, I was not here last year. Um, I'm glad to be here. I think it's, uh, I've had many conversations with many of you guys out there in terms of um, how I really see sort of revenue management becoming a lot more impactful in kind of the retailing space. Uh, in my mind, it is not a, it's not a distribution problem. It's not a revenue management problem. It's not a digital problem. Um, it's, it's a combined problem, and we have to really figure out how to solve that. Um, and so I'm glad that, uh, that uh, ATPCO is taking kind of, in my mind, the leadership role to kind of at least drive the conversation forward. Um, and I think we're only sort of going to see this become uh, probably a bigger conference and, and, and hopefully more revenue management, more airline folks in the future as well. Great. All right. So what's the cap next year? 340 now. Yeah. What's it going to be? Oh, 400? 400. <laughs> yeah. Well over 400. We got right? people crashing. We'll be back for five more years too. So if he comes the first time, five more years, he'll still be sitting. So there are people out there walking around without badges right now? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> there, yes, there are. Okay. So change. Um, every morning at ATPCO, we get reports on the amount of data that's gone through the system, the size of the data, the amount of churn. A lot of this is driven through branded fares, um, increased granularity, dynamic pricing will be increasing the numbers. Managing that content, the tools that we use today are going to have to change. If you want to get things to market quickly and accurately, you want to know what your competition is doing, you want to understand how your product is doing against your own goals, and you also are going to need more information in order to get the granularity you want for the customers. 
Well, a lot of this has been discussed, and today we want to bring it a little closer to home and talk a little bit about the specific data and tools that are really in, being looked at. So the first thing I wanted to talk about um, was we have, um, in collaboration with American, um, we've talked a little bit about the tool Mercury, and I wanted Marshall, Marshall, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on what Mercury is and um, what we're doing with it. Sure, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of a preamble in terms of, I think, why we're doing this. Um, when I look back, and uh, so I, I came uh, directly out of grad school before I joined the airline, which was uh, seven plus years ago. Um, a lot of the work, a lot of the research was always focused on yield management. Uh, you read a lot of the classic research papers, everybody focused on yield management, and everybody said pricing is just pricing. We don't really worry about it, it's just there. Um, and so, um, as I look to the future, and, and I realize that this is probably, you know, we talk a lot about retailing in the first half of the session. Um, in my mind, actually, I see there's a lot more juice in the orange, so to speak, when it comes to pricing um, and building in a lot more automation and a lot more science into the actual f pricing function, so to speak. Um, ATP Co has taken very much the, I think, uh, sort of the feedback from at least the airline community saying, hey, we need more automation in the sense of um, if I, um, today I can easily change a fair amount um, using Testing. choose your pricing tool and I can go do that. But if I choose to create a seasonality on a fair or I want to create a surcharge, uh, various categories of rules, those are still, at least for the most part, very much coded by hand. Um, and in my mind that doesn't, especially in this world where we think there's going to be a lot more fair, a lot more automation, um, I, I can't have a system that says, well, I think there needs to be a surcharge here and then give it over to some person and say, please go code this into ATP code. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And so we said, well, how do we now go ahead and build better automation for this? And the first part is you have to have the right pricing tool that supports this automation. So uh, at American Airlines, we, we went down the path and we said, well, uh, we looked at the market and we said, well, there are a bunch of pricing tools out there, but um, we believe actually building our own is probably the right way to go. Uh, not only because we can think about tying it into maybe the yield management system to make better decisions, but also because we can support the automation. So many of you know that ATPCO is currently working on and, and releasing more or less every month or so new APIs that allow us to directly interact with ATPCO. Anybody that has a pricing system out there should probably think about, well, does my pricing system support that API such that I can make more automated decisions going forward? We at American are actively working on that and uh, in collaboration with ATPCO and our colleagues at British Airways um, to bring that, uh, sort of that, that process to fruition, uh, which means that we have on our development roadmap the use of those APIs, which will allow us to become a lot more granular, a lot more, um, I'll call it speed to market. In my mind, speed to market is very important in this business because speed to market is how competitive or reactive you are to what your competition is doing. The faster you can bring that into the market, the better you're off. Um, so that's, that's, in my mind, the, the sort of the current world. Um, and then I'm going to put on my science hat for a second, which is, um, uh, again, we, we spent all this research and all this time to build mathematical models for yield management. It's time that we do that for pricing uh, because, uh, again, I look out there, I don't see a lot. Um, and when we think about not just pricing science, we think about bundling science, we think about how do I charge somebody for uh, Wi-Fi or for their seat assignment, and how do I make those integrated decisions? And so being able to kind of bring that into the marketplace and do that quickly is where I see a lot of um, sort of, again, that juice out of that orange that I think I can get to within the next year. Right? We talk a lot about sort of retailing and all these things being future sort of things that we're going to build, but I think this is actually something that we as an industry can accomplish within the next six months. Right. Okay. All right, Tom, did you want to share a little bit about how the Mercury fits into the AT Pico roadmap? Sure, and thanks, Marshall. Thanks for the, the intro. So, our, 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 I have no mic, I guess, still. <laughs> they're, they're punishing me. <laughs> so our strategy has been really to create a platform for anyone to connect into it with an open connectivity standards. We believe we should be the fundamental data layer to the industry with affairs and rules, and we continue to make sure it's reliable and efficient. But that data then needs to be exposed and utilized through the applications of the, uh, the airlines themselves, so the AAs and Mercury's, as well as the pros or whatever, and we need to be able to make that as the most efficient delivery mechanism as possible. We've been going down a path saying we won't build all the things in the world, but we're creating a collaboration platform where people can connect to it. Mercury is an excellent example where they saw that they needed to have it hosted by ATPCO so it could be a multi-carrier platform for their JV partners, as like Jim mentioned. And then with deep integrations into APIs to create the transactions to get them to flow through, you can get some quick wins and quick efficiencies of how to create your content more efficiently. Okay, great, Tom. 
All right, so that was a little bit about maintaining data and getting it into the marketplace quickly and accurately. Let's move on a little bit more to monitoring the competition and seeing what other people are doing. In order to do a lot of the work that you all do, you need to churn a lot of data and get through it. So with um, artificial intelligence and deep learning, can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the advances you're making in those areas in order to get through all of that data that's out there of all those airlines? And Yeah, it's, it's a lot. I mean, <clears throat> today, OneSearch, which is our shopping pricing engine, I mean, we consume no less than 400 carriers fares. And then on top of that, we have the availability, which the availability changes exponentially faster than the fares do. So it's not a problem we haven't had to solve before. I mean, I can give you anecdotes to where, I mean, just one small European carrier in our, our cloud with using a product like RTDP, I mean, we're processing more than 100 billion transactions a month, you know, in less than 25 milliseconds. And I mean, last month, I think we processed more transactions than Visa did the entire year. And that's only for maybe 10 carriers. So. The, the data is there, but you're right, it's, it's finding the signal through all the noise and shopping data tends to be very noisy, I mean, in terms of at least availability queries, but, you know, we have been working with um, a few different vendors and partners, I mean, we've been very public about our partnership with Microsoft, and so we've leveraged several of their tools and we've built our own homegrown tools because, I mean, pros, 30 years ago, we started as a, I mean, a small data science company, I mean, we were a mom and pop shop, basically a niche software company. And it was really a golden opportunity. We've you know, blossomed to a you know, global enterprise business. And so you know, we have a whole team of science and research like Mike, I mean Marshall has at American, uh, probably no less than 30 to 50 PhDs and you know, just focusing on these types. So we're, we're pretty close to the chest of what we create and we have to be because it's our competitive differentiator. But I can tell you we invest more than 25% in R&D every year just on science, science and research. And so whether it's leveraging third party tools or building our own tools to use this and, you know, competitive data is also interesting. It, it, it's not a silver bullet as Marshall, I mean, I know he's gonna chime in any minute because he and I feel <laughs> very, we, we have very differing viewpoints on some topics and you know, for many years we've had this email chain running back and forth so I was actually really surprised you put us on the same panel. I, I thought, did they know about that or <laughs> have they heard something? But no, actually it's, we have really good professional banter for many years but I think we share the same opinion when it comes to competitive data is that it, it can be very noisy and it has to be, you have to be careful how you use it. Because trying to include competitive data inside a willingness to pay forecaster is probably not the best thing to do. Because you're trying to predict the future. You don't necessarily know where your competitor is going to be in the future. It's a game you're playing. And so you have to figure out how your rivals are going to materialize and then how your competitor's fares are going to manipulate your rivals versus how your fares can manipulate theirs. And so it's this back and forth. And so sometimes it's better to put competitive in a different box and then focus on data like whether it's reservations data or fares paid data that tends to be a little more stable inside of some of the core forecasting or optimization. But I don't know, how do you feel, Marshall? Uh, I'm, I'm probably gonna say this is the first time I actually agree with you. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, like we've come a long way. No, yeah, I, uh, I know. Uh, but, but then maybe we'll just bring up dynamic pricing and then we'll, 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 we'll be you know, drawing the line right here. I have a gag order on um, dynamic pricing. The last time I talked about dynamic pricing, I got producers from USA, USA Today calling me and Chuck Schumer <laughs> calling for an investigation. So that's a sort of hands-off <laughs> topic right now <laughs> for me. Oh, so don't ask sure. me questions. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, yeah, like I said, I, I agree with, uh, with, with your points on this because um, I'll, I'll put it this way. We, uh, we at American are certainly looking at a lot of data sources, right? Um, uh, data is a way that we can make better decisions. But it presents, in my mind, several kind of um, uh, difficulties, if that's the right word, that we need to figure out how, over, how to overcome. Um, I know I'm not wearing my little big data sticker, uh, my flare that I got earlier, because I think actually um, it should be called like huge data or something, whatever is bigger than big data, yeah. because part of it is that shopping data is so massive, um, at least as, as an American Airlines, we're trying to figure out how to, how to get it all. Um, so not only are we talking about storage systems and actually the actual infrastructure um, to actually be able to go and use this and, and ingest all of this data, whether it's from uh, ATP Co or whether it's from um, uh, other vendors that provide this information. We also have to worry about computation. So not, not only do I worry about the actual physical storage, now I have to figure out how to compute it, uh, which is also not cheap because I have all this sort of haystack that I'm looking through. 
Um, and the last but least, not least, I have to actually have the right people, which means talent. Um, you know, team members that have these special skills that can work in cloud systems and write Python code um, and R code that can bounce against these systems and be able to kind of figure out what the right solution is. Um, uh, it's, it's a certain talent pool that um, I, I think, frankly, we don't have enough of at American Airlines. We hire uh, people in that field, but it's, in my mind, also kind of a wake-up call that as an industry, we need to yeah. recognize that um, to be able to kind of build systems that, that ingest data and make better automated decisions, there is also a certain level of skill set of uh, folks that we need to make sure that we kind of um, hire. Actually, we're surprisingly on the same page because <laughs> as a you know, major provider of revenue management software for many, many years now, I've come to the conclusion that there's no silver bullet. I've tried to satisfy a global customer base with a common set of tools, and it becomes increasingly difficult because you realize is that there are just different dynamics in different markets. They have different competitive dynamics. There are cultural reasons. There are, I mean, just the way traffic, you know, behaves in certain markets is very different. It's expat or it's, you know, ethnic or migrant, et cetera. And so I've come to the conclusion that, you know, providers should be thinking about open platforms, meaning that I do envision that in 20 years, 10 years time, that if we really wanted to bring, you know, personalization and various degrees to, to market, it's going to require a set of skill sets that the typical RM analyst doesn't necessarily have today. They're pretty good at saying, oh, the demand may change a little bit, so they put in an influence. But I, I tend to think that in 10 years' time is that, especially with so many advanced degrees programs on data scientists, we're going to end up with a new breed of talent that is trained. I mean, I spent years in graduate school coding my own, and so I know what that talent pool is like, and it's only increasing. Right? It's, it's not as in you know, low demand. I mean, it's, it's abundant. And so as a provider of technology, yes, Pros is going to have its own secret sauce. But I do believe that airlines will come to the table with their own data scientists. And I want them to interact and create their own science and make it easy for them to say, you know what? In that market, you do a great job, Pros. But in that market, because of these you know, conditions and these types of products, because we can't do advanced boarding or we can't do this, we can't offer that product because we can't fulfill it. We need this type, and I think I can step in and create my own. And so that's really what we're focused on at Pros is giving, actually, I hate to use the term personalization, but kind of bringing more personalization to actually our products. Right. Yeah, and maybe one other point to, sorry, Brenda, but, but I think this is. Uh, I actually wasn't going to answer any questions. I know, I I know you promised that. You're doing a I great did. job. <laughs> the, uh, uh, one of the other things that I think is, as, as we talk about sort of competitive data and monitoring, which is kind of, I think actually the question you asked as opposed to us pontificating about uh, sort of, you know. People and people, platforms. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, there's a good amount to something where I look at what ATP provides today, right, with, with sort of fair subscription data. And, and to me, I think that, you know, for, for the longest time, we've, we've kind of accepted that as um, this is good fair information. We feel, under, like we feel like we have a good understanding of what's going on in the marketplace. And I think that's actually what's changing. So when we think about sort of monitoring the marketplace, I think there's very much a role for ATP Co. Um, I think this is also evolving at the same time. And so we are thinking about, um, well, what are these other data sources, right? Where, where do I get this, uh, this shopping data from? Where do I get this uh, competitive data from? Um, one thing that we're realizing is, by the way, this is not cheap, um, right? So as, as we think about not only the infrastructure, it's also about the fact that, yes, uh, uh, these data providers, I always joke, uh, you're really selling us our own data back to us, so why am I paying for it? But um, yes, this is, this is not something that comes uh, sort of on a silver platter. It's, uh, they, they're usually attached with kind of a, a big quarterly check. Right, so, so that kind of leads us to the, the thought of transparency, right? So I think with dynamic pricing and a lot of these drivers in the market, there's going to be a drive towards a little bit less transparency just because there's many different distributions. So there's going to be a need to get that information. And I know, Tom, we've had some conversations not necessarily talking about transparency, but let's talk about an opaque market where you can only do product performance. What kind of challenges you know, have you thought and have you talked with the industry about that would come if the market was more opaque? Yeah, we, we did a study um, uh, a little over a year ago with Pods MIT and trying to tell you how do we transform the fair management role and the re yield management role. And one of the key deficiencies they said were the key obstacles are in the way is lack of good quality data that can drive the processes in order to move it forward. The fairs and rules information has been very robust 
Glastonbury Ridge for many, many years, but it's got to go beyond that, specifically when we talk about NDC, dynamic pricing, and the like. So I think new data sources will come in play customer insights, feedback loops, we even talk about some of the stuff that Bob's doing with Root Happy and saying this is the take rate and those kind of things, they might be more prevalent. And then there'll be a role then maybe for another, like Jim said, another clearinghouse function saying how do we clear and share data so that we all can yeah. make better decisions and not bad decisions of how we price and move things forward. So I think from ATP Co, we're evaluating those to see how we can help the industry source the data in a neutral, honest, validated way in order to move it forward. And then the last maybe comment or thought is, uh, it was interesting at the AAC innovation session yesterday that we held, one of the ideas that came forward is, we're all paying and trying to capture different types of data sources. Each company is doing it. It's costing us a lot. Could we centralize that? Could we do that one time and make it more efficient for the industry? And that's one of the ideas that they actually brought forward with different data types. Great. So Tom, sorry, I'm gonna okay. jump in here. <laughs> it's because you mentioned the clearinghouse and I remember years ago, we had a discussion about the industry sales record, the ISR. And I, I thought that would have evolved to when, you know, eventually when the world evolves and we have NDC orders and offers, why wouldn't that, re, you know, sort of evolve to handle NDC orders towards like a give for get type of model? And, and it could. I think it actually evolved more into the DDS product from ARC and from, from IATA, where they cooperate and create a sales data exchange process. So we didn't do it because there was one in the marketplace already available there, but there could be other data sources like that that could grow into it. I mean, because I do sympathize with carriers and the fact that as everybody starts to take control of their own offers, right? That's really what we're talking about here. I have my own set of products. I believe for whatever reason, my product is differentiated by this or that. We've invested a lot of money in this and we want to be able to showcase it. How would you get insight into others besides going to somebody's website and scraping it? So now we're back in the QL2 in fair days. And so I'd like to see airlines, you know, you know, put their hat in the ring and say, you know what? We'd be happy with a give or get model. I know it happens with corporate, right? Corporate deals. I mean, I think Prism did it for years, if I recall. And so I think there's an opportunity there as a give or get to say, these are my orders. Maybe you anonymize some of it, because you can't share you know, passenger information, whether it's you know, nationality, birth dates, or emails, or credit cards, but I think just statistics of, here's what people are paying, here are the attributes, here's what they're paying for, right? I mean, the NDC message, you know, self-describing, it provides that level of transparency, is that, yes, basic may not be the same on United and American, right? Because of, but when you look at the product attributes, you'll be able to discern and say, you're right, Americans' basic is different than United's basic. Here's what people really wanted to pay for. I, I think the difference there is that that sounds like a very reactive way of thinking, like in the sense of I see sales that are happening as opposed to I'm preemptively looking out in the future and seeing, well, what is my competitive position to somebody else? Which, by the way, I, you know, we, we talk about this idea of opacity, but um, I, I certainly, you know, this is a very competitive business. Um, and we will, not maybe not the airlines, will find ways to uh, figure out to create more transparency, even if there is an opaque world. Um, there will be opportunities for maybe a startup out there to say, hey, by the way, we've got this great new way of sourcing data, and, uh, and, and, and here it is, right? Um, just like any other business out there that where it matters, where people com comparison shop, um, that, that will happen. So I, I don't think it's necessarily that um, op uh, sort of transparency will go away. I think it'll shift in terms of what it may look like in the future. Um, but it's not, in my mind, like I said, it's not going to go away. Okay. Great. Um, another, the next area that we wanted to talk about a little bit too was on uh, monitoring your own performance. So let's take a world where it does get a little bit more opaque and you need to spend some time looking at performance and some of our, co your own product performance and some of our conversations you've talked about how the airlines are set up today in silos. You have your loyalty, you've got your merchandising and as data gets more and more granular and you're needing to monitor, you know, look at your own product performance, how do you think that's going to impact airline organizations and what they'll need to do to um, deal with all that data? Is that for me? Yes, Marshall. Okay. Sorry, Marshall. <laughs> yes, Marshall. Uh, it, it's a great question, and, and honestly, I, um, I don't think we have figured that out. Um, uh, speaking for American Airlines, obviously. Um, I think it's in part because of the fact that the, this world, let me talk about maybe performance today, because the performance today uh, is, like you said, very silo. We think about, um, uh, here's my revenue performance on a flight, which is really agnostic to, um, am I selling any seats? Am I selling uh, bags? 
all of that is kind of in a separate pool and we don't really think about sort of that whole aircraft optimization, right? Um, and so um, in the future, um, and, and we're trying to take steps towards that. So in other words, um, if for example, I am selling basic on a certain flight, well, what is my upsell rate? And is that actually a good outcome, for example? Um, but going back to the, the, the discussion of, well, am I actually able to measure sort of, again, that whole, here are all the people that are sitting on this aircraft, um, and have I maximized revenue with respect to all of these sort of retail options that a customer had? We have not figured that out. Um, I think it also goes back a little bit to this idea, I think somebody mentioned it earlier, maybe it was uh, Jim and, and, and Don when you guys talked about it, but this idea that um, traditional retailing thinks about how do I sell you that t-shirt? Um, and in our business, it's the, I don't want you to buy this ticket right now because I think there's gonna be more value coming later. Um, I, I think the revenue management problem is actually is, is so unique um, that uh, there is no other one out there like it in the sense of uh, perishable in inventory that becomes more valuable as it gets closer to departure. That, give me another industry where that happens and people say, ah, oh, rental car, uh, rental car maybe, but, uh, but that's probably as close as you get to it. So in other words, we have this very unique optimization problem where it's less about maximizing conversions uh, because I can, con I, can, I can maximize conversions very easily um, and then measure how successful I was at maximizing those conversions, but that's not the objective function. And so part of us, what we have to really do is we have to think about how do I maximize revenue and then how do I measure that and come back and say, yes, this was the right decision. And again, we haven't completely figured that out yet. Okay, right. In terms of monitoring um, airlines product, we've talked in the industry about new benchmarks, Tom. Some things that maybe would be new ways to help an airline see how they're doing in a particular market. What are some thoughts that you've had on ways that we could help the airlines do that? Yeah, this is kind of where um, maybe BI comes into play, where you start to say, can you do some average value and can you do some kind of comparison where you can take the data and be able to say, am I product performing based on how it is expected to do and based on what the what the industry barometer can say to do? This is where I think maybe ATP Go again has a role where we can help provide some new data sources or new data information or new BI that will help you doing the benchmarking. There was always, you know, the whole QSI and, Q, and those kind of kind of metrics of whether you're at. Maybe there's a new QSI that's going to be in the marketplace, which is quality service product, if we will, make, saying this is the overall product experience using some of the root happy data in order to move that. And you can kind of benchmark yourself using that and other kind of data components as well. I think there might also be an opportunity here, now that I think about it, because of some of the discussion actually I've, I've had here at Elevate with uh, various folks. Um, we talk a lot about third-party channels, at least we have today, in terms of how do I integrate, for example, um, a Root Happy with uh, a fair management and making sure that our customers get a good experience on third-party channels. Um, to my knowledge, uh, we, for example, don't really actively have a way to get feedback today from those third-party channels that are telling us, for example, um, hey, your customers aren't buying your seat on our platform. We put it in front of them, they're not buying it. And, and being able to bring that information back to us and saying, Maybe you guys need to think about whether it's the product proposition, maybe it's the price, maybe it's the, uh, the picture of the seat, whatever the case may be. And so in this world where we now will have sort of more attribute, maybe attribute-based shopping, we do need to create some sort of feedback loop that allows us as an airline to get that feedback and understand um, what works about our product and what doesn't. Um, because again, in, in the traditional world where we are today, we only think about, well, is somebody buying our ticket or are they not? And then sorry, and, and sort, of, uh, the, sort of the retail mindset comes afterwards where we try to kind of sell people um, after the fact. But if we're now saying, yes, I'm gonna give you that um, sort of brand shopping experience, I also am, as an airline, gonna need feedback of what is working in certain channels and what doesn't. Because in my mind, channel is also very much a form of segmentation. The folks that are coming directly to AmericanAirlines.com, including John, I hope. All the um, time. Yeah. Um, they're, they're a very different subset of the population than the folks that are um, going to, for example, a Kayak or a Expedia of the world. Um, and that's just self-selection because of uh, sort of more price sensitive customers versus maybe customers who prefer the schedule or the product that we offer. And so I think part of that feedback is important as we think about sort of this idea of retailing mindset because we have, as an airline would certainly like to get insight into that channel and that performance of those different products. Okay. I think it would be challenging though because would you be able to dictate the terms of which you are presented, your offer is presented on that third party because you, you wouldn't have the control necessarily, right? But we, we did a little study on the customer insight side, and one of the things that came out of that, they said it would be really interesting to know what he was presented and what they actually took. 
So if you just had that base level information, not necessarily you controlled what was presented, mm -hmm. but what was presented and what they actually took, you can take that behavioristic information and start applying that to your models and saying, okay, this is really interesting information of really what is the take rate of what was the different alternatives in the market, but the disutility of the different offerings and bringing those back in. Mm -hmm. Great. We have a little bit less than a minute. Any final words from anybody? I guess we can continue this at the networking, so. Yes, this so we should. Topic. I think they'll be very I interesting. I have some thoughts now, yeah. so. Well, I think there's a lot to unravel. There's a lot of change in the industry, and there's a lot of people looking out for what we need to do and building tools to help us get there. So I thank you very much for participating in the panel and look forward to seeing you next year. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>